Let me talk a little bit about natural law and marriage. Let me first define natural law and explain a little bit about why it might be important in this kind of a context. If, if you were to, to read at least philosophical or theological liter about, literature about natural law, you would often find it defined as reason reflecting upon nature. So the reason you have natural in the term natural law is not because it seems to come to people naturally, but because it is a call to think about our natures. And natural law reasoning, therefore, is reflecting on the es essential natures of the things that we are encountering, and in effect asking the question, what does this per thing, particular thing look like done well? What are the things that are contrary to its nature and might cause it harm? What are the things that are compatible with its nature and might help it to flourish? Those are the kinds of things you think about when you're thinking from a natural law sort of a framework. And so if you're to do this for human beings, you would stop and think, well, what are the essential features of being human? And you can come up with a lot of these things. And the thing I want you to, to impress upon you is that these are pretty objective features of a human being. This aren't, isn't subjective. Well, you think this is important to being human, and I think that's important to being human. I want art. You want science. It isn't that kind of a discussion. It's far more rudimentary. So you have uh, things like we have animal features. We need nutrition, metabolism, procreation, right? These are, this is just how human beings live. We could live in other ways. Other plants and animals on planet Earth need other needs, but those are things that we need. We have the ability to voluntarily initiate action. That distinguishes us from plant life, for sure, because plants don't choose to do anything. And it might even distinguish us at a certain level from animal life because I think most of the time, I, I understand people love to debate this right now, but I think in the big picture, most of us, as we look at animals, realize an awful lot of their behavior is instinctual. And so they have a nature within them and then they get some impetus from the environment around them. And you can explain almost everything going on with an animal by the impetus and the response um, from their instinct. And with human beings, at the very least, that becomes a lot more complex to actually account for. And so these kinds of features for human beings, you suddenly realize, oh, it's because of that that we have a moral life. We perceive ourselves as being able to choose things, to act according to our instinct, or to choose not to act in accordance with our instinct. One of my friends in high school had this saying that he liked for whatever reason, but it was a very quaint one. He says, the only difference between you and a cow is that you can say no. Now, I'd like to go on record as saying there are a few other differences between me and a cow. But it is an interesting observation that that is one of the big ones, is that cows really don't do a lot of no saying. We do. And there's a pretty fundamental grip on our, our souls that we have that capacity as part of our own just human experience. And we might be wrong about cows. We don't know that for sure. But what we do know is we're right about ourselves. We can choose. And we hold ourselves responsible for choosing. Um, language, history, memory capacities, all of these higher human intellectual abilities Human beings alone are history makers. That is a thing that we are commonly uh, attributed to. Uh, it is an interesting thing to realize how much of human culture, how much of your lives is shaped by a very, very fundamental fact about human beings that is different than other animal life. You learn not just from your parents, but from the entire legacy of human history. So the reason your parents knew what your parents knew was because they learned it from other people who had learned it before. And probably a lot of things they learned were things that were learned by people 100 generations ago, and other people 100 years ago, and some people 10 years ago. But you have built into your mind an incredible legacy from human beings that have lived all around the planet over millennia whose accumulated wisdom has, in effect, been poured into your mind to the complex process of human beings, in effect, writing human history, not in the history book sense, but carrying forward history and experience that other people have learned. 
interesting feature of, of, of human beings. We're highly social, highly, highly social beings. Um, we talk about America being an individualistic society, and I think that's a very appropriate phraseology to use. Uh, but I do want to go on record as saying that even for an American, the worst form of punishment that we allow at least to be carried out is solitary confinement. You really want to nail some guy who is absolutely misbehaving. He just got through, he was thrown up, you know, put up in prison for murdering someone. He got into prison and he killed somebody else and you're really going to come down and what do you do? You, you lock him down in solitary confinement. And that's one of those reminders that, oh wow, we are deeply social beings. We don't just go social for entertainment. It's not like we, I want to go to Disneyland, the happiest place on earth. Oh, I want to have a social relationship, the second happiest thing on earth. That isn't the way sociality works for human beings. It is far, it is almost as essential to us as food and water. And when you deprive a person of that, it becomes incredibly distorting to their human personality. This is one of the interesting things that they actually learned, is a bad way to put it, but it was learned through the experience of orphans in Romania, who were, many were abandoned, they were left in orphanages, and they were given all the food they needed and none of the love. And the effect that this had on the kids was just breathtaking. Part of it is things like the inability to learn language. After about 18 or 19 months of this kind of a treatment, they ended up with something physiologically happening in the brain that basically left them unable to learn human language. Um, they had all kinds of other problems that, you know, I can't even go down the list, I don't know it but basically because of social deprivation. And that happening before age two. And in effect, you realize if that doesn't get laid in the foundation before age two, you can't make up for it. You can't do anything in the next 78 years of your life to make up a, for a lack of that social contribution. So these are things that you begin to look at and say, wow, human beings are interesting creatures. Our ability to worship inclination, drivenness to worship. These are just all features that you look at human nature and say, yeah, this is part of us. What do we make of it? I don't know. But as you begin to list those things off, you realize, wow, there's actually a lot of work that can be done thinking about our nature and asking what are the implications of this for how we should behave? What behavior should we reward? What behavior should we punish? What should we think is a good thing? What should we think is a bad thing? So that's the general idea of natural law. Um, and I think, let me just look up here. Yeah, so reasoning about our conduct in light of our nature. A broad set of features by which thoughtful examination could probably be said to be distinctive human beings. I just gave you a batch of those things. In a secondary sense, natural law is a term which is used for the shared core of morality, which is very broadly held in all human societies. Uh, a phrase that is probably familiar <laughs> to you guys from uh, Romans 2 is uh, the law that is written on their hearts. And so that is a secondary sense of, of the phrase natural law that is used commonly. And I just am really pointing this out because it took me a long time to figure out that natural law is used in these two really different ways. They are not unrelated, but they really aren't the same thing. One is a relatively technical philosophical exercise that is pretty radically objective. It really does attach to things that are universally accessible to all human beings. You can look at a person and say, yeah, well, you know, you're actually right about that feature of human nature. Of course we can discuss and refine it, but it's pretty objective. The natural law written on your hearts, what is the content of that, is actually pretty objective as well, number one. And number two, I would like to argue that a lot of those elements are objective or universal because we share a universal human nature. And certain conduct is compatible with flourishing as a human being, certain other conduct is incompatible. So you end up with a world that has like prohibitions against stealing. Why? Because unlike a plant that may only need things that are universally available, sunlight and water, we don't charge people for either one of those in our world. You may need a lot of things beyond that in order to thrive. So we're gonna make prohibitions against stealing my things because things are almost essential for human beings to live well in the world. For a tree, that might not be true. 
for a human being it is. So a lot of things that end up in this kind of intuitive, natural law written in your hearts really are derived from an effect reasoning about human nature. So those are two different ways in which the term is used. Um, and I am primarily going to be using it in that first sense. But as I said, the, the second sense is probably even more common in terms of how people think about it outside of a philosophical context. Why do I think thinking about this from a natural law standpoint is important at all? Well, I should perhaps first point out that for the sake of social legislation and political discourse, appeal to scripture or Christian theology or Christian doctrine is going to be fairly limited in terms of its function. Because in a pluralistic society where there is no pride of place legislatively given to the Christian faith, to argue that the Christian faith teaches that something should be the case is interesting. I'd like to argue there's nothing wrong with that. Some people would say there is. You shouldn't even bring Christian discourse into the you know, public uh, square, and I just think that's silly. I, I mean, everyone is going to be arguing f in the public square from whatever they hold to be their deepest convictions, right? And if you're a Christian, or, or if you're Muslim, or if you're whatever religion, those are the things that are going to shape your, your discourse in a public square. So I think it's just nuts to think that we can suddenly bracket all of those sorts of things, and the only thing that would count is some kind of a secularized, de-religious, religified uh, sort of understanding or belief. But that said, if someone's arguing for a point because that's what Hinduism teaches, I want you to stop and think if that means you feel compelled to vote for it. And my guess is the answer is no, or at the very least, you'll only agree if you're saying, it doesn't cost me anything, so I'll go ahead and go along with the Hindus to make them happy because I don't care. And they do, so we'll all be happier if they get what they want because this isn't an important thing to me. So it's a very thin argument when you pour, appeal to a single religious tradition in contemporary American discourse. The goal of a natural law argument is to appeal not to a particular religious tradition, but to a universal human nature. And that is a much harder thing to push back against if you're going to be making an argument uh, about some sort of a moral or political social policy kinds of, of issue. So natural law argumentation has the advantage of appealing to something that's comparatively objective and hard to deny or avoid, namely human nature. Uh, if we can all agree that that is actually true of human beings, then it becomes a whole lot harder to dodge the bullet, so to speak. And just conceptually, you're now beginning your argument with a set of shared premises. In other words, these are things that are true of human nature. Let's see where this will lead us in the argument. And hopefully both of you can look at these things if you have two opposing viewpoints say, yes, we do agree. These are common features of human nature. We may disagree on where it leads, but at least we have a common set of premises. And that's uh, a significant advantage in, in public discourse. So here's the idea. Uh, let's do this relative to marriage. If we're going to take this kind of natural lodge posture, we're going to do a little bit of reason reflecting on nature. What about nature, what about human nature might inform a vision for how marriage ought to, ought to work? So let me make a few suggestions of some relevant features of human nature that might contribute to a vision of what marriage ought to be in a human society. First of all, we are this sounds really fancy, but I'm just giving you a little of zoological kind of uh, language, because like I say, we're talking about our nature. Dimorphic creatures, sexually dimorphic creatures that mate for life. Dimorphic means we come in two forms. We have traditionally called that male and female, though people have now decided it's time to dispute that distinction. But generally speaking, it is a pretty good rough and ready distinction between human beings that we come in two forms. And they are sexually dimorphic. In other words, you could have dimorphism that is not sexual. You could be distinguished by other features. So it could be, imagine a world in which everyone had both male and female genitalia, but some people had black hair and some people had white hair, and you were dimorphic, you have two different forms or expressions, but you're distinguished by hair color or size or bulk or whatever your, your other option is, not sexually differentiated. Point we're making here is that as a matter of fact, in human nature, 
we are indeed sexually dimorphic, number one. And number two, we are creatures who mate for life. Now, you may argue, well, isn't divorce a disproof of that? And let me just explain again. Think human nature in a zoology class, okay? So if you go to a zoology class and check mammalian life forms, of which we are one, and ask how many of these end up having multiple partners, in other words, every mating season you mate with a new partner, versus every mating season you mate with the same partner. And you would basically find that roughly speaking, I think it's about 3% of mammalian life forms are mate for life. And again, of course that is in quotes. Sometimes one of the partners will get killed if you are a, you know, wolf. I don't know if wolf's mate for life or not, but anyhow, you know, whatever, whatever the mammalian species in question is, um, of course there are possibilities that allow a person or one of these animals to mate with some other animal in the course of events. This is one of those rough and ready distinctions where you have some that you clearly have, you mate once and that is the end of the contact. Generally speaking, those animals are raised to maturity within a single one year cycle and by the time the next year rolls around, it's their job to go have their little mating experience and reproduce the species as they go along through life. 97% of the time in mammalian life forms, you, you do not have a mate for life pattern. Primates, that's our particular, what is primate? Is that an order? Who's a biology major here? Anyhow, whatever we are, whatever primates are, um, we're the only primate species that mates for life. Go figure. Uh, what do you want to read into that? We're not done yet, but right now I'm just making an observation that we are sexually dimorphic <laughs> creatures that mate for life. Number one. Number two, human children require long-term nurture. So my dog is now just about exactly one year old. She at one year old is ready to go do whatever it is that German shepherds ever do. Um, she can dig the snot out of my backyard. She's very good at that. She has acquired that skill. She can chase a squirrel. She can't catch a squirrel, but in this case, I'm not banking on her ever being able to chase. She is not a genius hunter. This dog is well suited to the domestic lifestyle. Out in the wild, she would be in trouble very quickly. But she is full size. She weighs about, I don't know, 70 pounds, I would guess by now, 70 or 75 pounds. She's not gonna get any bigger. Unfortunately, I doubt she'll get any smarter. Uh, she is, uh, you know, full-blown, complete, ready-to-roll dog one year into the game. If we hadn't taken a little trip to the vet, she'd be able to have little doglets um, at this point. She's ready to be a mom, uh, in theory, not in practice, but that's, you know, one year. One year. All that's required. And I could send this dog out into the wild of the woolly world and she would be as equipped as she's ever going to be to do it. Can you imagine sending a one-year-old human infant out into the world to fend for his or herself? <laughs> Just imagine. Not even close. As I often point out, as a father of a 22-year-old, I still have a few sketchy thoughts about 22-year-olds in this task, much less 22-month-olds. It takes a long time to make a human being. So we are sexually dimorphic creatures who mate for life. When we get done mating, we pop out a child that takes a long time to get with the program. A really long time. And they need fairly constant tending throughout the course of that time and vast quantities of resources. Enormous quantities of resources. Breathtaking quantities of resources, especially when they're in college. Uh, male and females are an approximately equal proportion in the population. So you check human beings and you find out, I think, what was it? I just haven't seen statistics. I think it's 50.6% of the population is male, which means that 49.4% of the population is female. So basically, I mean, basically nothing, almost exactly identical quantities of male and female in the population. And again, is that optional? Absolutely. 
Uh, how many females are there in an ant colony? Just one, right? The queen. And everybody else is a drone, and then they have a bat. Well, not everybody. There's a whole pile of kind of asexual ants who go out and, I don't know what they do, lift things up, whatever those ants do. And then there's a handful of male, who are they, the soldiers? Somebody does the job of making the queen pregnant. I don't know how this works. I'm not up on ants. But anyhow, it, it's not like us. Okay, so the numbers in the animal kingdom are not necessarily 50-50, right? They can be wildly different. This, this is a very arbitrary thing in terms of how things could be. But as a matter of fact for human beings, we are of the 50-50 variety. We are also very ill-equipped to live in our environment without transforming it. Back to my year old dog. My wife and I continue to have this debate as it gets colder. We should, oh Rick, we can't, we, 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 we can't leave the dog outside. It's too cold. <laughs> and I go, sure, it's 50 degrees outside. The dog is a mass of hair. She will be fine. She doesn't even look cold. She doesn't even act cold. And so we have this discussion. And the bottom line is I don't think my dog is going to die even if I win the debate, which is highly unlikely. And we keep the dog outside through the whole winter. I think she'll survive just fine. She's a dog, for heaven's sakes. You guys, on the other hand, are hairless bipeds. <laughs> That's the phrase that was eloquently coined to describe the, uh, the human being. And if I leave you outside at 40 degrees and you cannot work on your environment and transform it, you know what you are the next morning? You're dead. You're just dead meat. We'll just roll you over the walk-in locker. Uh, you are so ill-equipped to live in this world without transforming it. Again, highly optional. You could have been a dog, and you would have been just fine, especially in Southern California. And there's dogs, you know, you think about polar bears that live in the Arctic. There's dogs, you know, you've seen the huskies and things like that. They live outside in Canada in the winter. And in a blizzard, they just curl up. No problem. They're well equipped to live in their environment without transforming. Human beings, lousy in that regard, just plain lousy. And then finally, that's the bad news for human beings. The good news for human beings is we are well equipped to live in large and complex societies. So here's the cool thing. If you were left to your own devices and had to do all the transformation of your environment to be able to live within it, uh, it'd be tough. It'd be tough. You could do it, but it would be tough. But the more complex the society gets, the easier it becomes to live in all kinds of crazy places. I can't hardly believe this, but there's actually human beings who live in Phoenix. I mean, it's like 12 million degrees all summer. The, 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 the pavement gets soft and mushy. It begins to melt. I don't even know why. You would think it was just hell, and somehow, you know, it got kind of squirted out for a little preliminary preview there in Arizona. So how in the world can you live in a place like this? Well, air conditioning. Who comes up with air conditioning? Well, in, interesting story, glad you asked. So you have, who is it, Bernoulli's principal? Anybody a physics major here? Bernoulli is the guy who discovered that if gas, as it suddenly expands, it decreases in temperature, and that's basically, that's why you have air conditioning. Now, why air conditioning runs when it's 45 degrees outside, now that I have no idea why, but someone at Biola could explain that to you because it feels like we're about to freeze to death in here. So that whole process is an incredibly complex thing. Bernoulli, some Italian physicist, works on that. Some other guy says, hey, if that's true of any gas, what about if we found the right gas that was really did it at the right temperature, could really cool things down, and the next thing you know, you have refrigeration. Next thing you know, you're not just refrigerating your food, but you're refrigerating your whole house. All of those things require an incredibly complex society to be able to sustain it. Uh, it at a simpler level, you think of kind of the classic Amish barn raising scene where you put together the barn and you realize no one person could build a barn. But if you have 100 people, if you have 15 people, you can build a barn with no real high level technology. But you can't build it alone, no matter how technologically savvy you are. So these are all, relatively speaking, I think self-evident features of, of human society, you might, of human beings. You might not have thought of all of those, 
But once they're pointed out to you, you look at them and say, well, yeah, that's pretty much true of human beings. Now the interesting question is, what in the world does that mean about marriage? Well, if we are sexually dimorphic, that means we're going to have to do something to get male and female together in order to procreate. So we have two options. We die as a species, or we get male and female together. Uh, this is not me being like some heterosexual fan here. I am just making the observation that you're going to have to get male and female together to produce the next generation. That is a feature of human nature. So you're going to have to do something across genders or sexes. Number two, we're going to have to do something monogamous. Now, this is where I begin to get pushback from people instantly who say, well, aren't there all kinds of polygamous societies in the, not only the history of the world, wasn't, didn't the Bible have polygamy? Aren't there polygamous societies in Africa? We say things like this, and I would like to say a simple thing back. 50-50. How many females are there for every male? One. Are there any such thing, is there any such thing as a polygamous society? Nope. There's only polygamous elites. So you can have an elite in your society, the rich, the powerful, the whatever you want to choose your elite factor by, it doesn't matter. They can be polygamous. But you can't have a polygamous society as a whole. If you, yeah. Talking strictly like natural rights, I mean like in China there's the one child policy and they've created a situation where it's not 50-50 anymore because a lot of families are aborting their girl babies because they want a son. And so in that situation it's not 50-50 then, but are you just right. talking about like natural rights? Well, uh, no, I'm happy to go, that I am talking number one about nature and then I want you to think about what has happened now in China. This is one of these great things, human nature. It's really a weird thing. So why is it that you abort a female baby? Because you want a son. You want a son. Why do you want a son? Because he will have the job and take care of you in your old age and bear your family name. OK, he's going to bear your family name and all that. OK, great. Let's just keep the bear your family name as an easy way to have the discussion. So back in the good old days, before we could have abortions, <laughs> what percentage of Chinese males could bear the family name on into the next generation, roughly speaking, theoretically. If you have 50 Chinese males out of a pool of 100, how many of those could potentially bear the family name and carry on the next generation? All of them. Nowadays, if you have 100 people, you have 73 males and 27 women. How many Chinese males can bury their, bear their name into the next generation? Creepy, huh? So your big value was that you want to be able to carry your name forward. And what have you done? You've created a situation which only half of your people can actually successfully do that. Why? Because we're 50-50 and you have violated human nature. And the perverse thing about that one is the exact thing you wanted is the exact thing you destroy by messing with the system. Uh, so our interventions are really, really interesting when we start messing with nature. If this stuff was arbitrary, it wouldn't matter. But what they've really done in, in uh, China is with that create a situation where bigamy is possible as a society. It's just that women get two men. And we'll just check and see how eager guys are to buy off on that, number one, just attitude-wise. Number two, I want you to stop and think is the direction of polygamy as wildly arbitrary as we sometimes would like to make it, or is there actually something physiological that makes polygamy work better when a man is having two wives than when a woman is having two husbands? And the bottom line is when one of the key functions of marriage and family, marriage is family, a man can have two sons cooking in two different ovens at the same time. A woman cannot do that. Right? You don't get to get pregnant multiple times all at once. So polygamy is an uh, unequal institution in that, 
in that sense, where it only really works very well in one direction. Yeah? What if it wasn't like a polygamous relationship, but it was more like just people sleeping with each other and having kids and there is no... A non-marriage. Yeah, like there's no, like a non-committal society. Yeah. Do you have like records of that going on? Yes, and we're also trying it in modern day Europe. Um, I mean, just kind of a, one of those little experiments to see how it works. So nowadays in Europe, it's becoming increasingly uncommon for people to marry. And it's an interesting thing, back to the China thing. Okay, great, we've done the experiment. How is it working? Um, answer that question, this will come up later in the lecture, but hey, as long as you brought it up, we'll do it now. Um, you know how it's working? You know what the birth rates are in Western Europe? Yeah, between around 1.4 to 1.5, some cases worse, per every two adults. So if you have 200, the easiest way to think about it, if you have 200 adults, how many children will they produce? Answer to the question, 140, 150 children. Um, if you're asking what how many children have to be produced in order to maintain zero population growth? You know what the answer to that is? About 210. So you need about 2.1 kids for every married, for every couple to just re replenish the population. You know what that means? If 2.1 is what you need and 1.4 is what you've got? That is 33% below reproduction levels. Zero population growth, you're 33% below that. You know what percentage of the population the Black Plague killed in Europe in the 1400s and 1300s? About 33%. So you know what you have right now is a dynamic equivalent of the Black Plague happening in terms of the destruction of population in Western Europe basically because of the dismantling of the institution of, of marriage and family, which simply has been the way that people have been able to sustain and reproduce the population successfully. It, it just is a statistical fact that married couples are far more likely to reproduce children, number one, and number two, more children than any other mixture. I understand that a woman could go and buy a sperm at a sperm bank and have a baby. But what you want to stop and ask yourself the question is, back to this issue of human beings living in society, is that sufficient? Will that be sufficient to reproduce the population? And the answer is not even vaguely close. Not even close. Uh, so this is one of those interesting encounters you have with just, again, the reality of, of human nature. So monogamy is not an arbitrary feature of human society. In fact, when, oh, the other kind of the dark side of this, if you take a look at uh, like Colorado City, so whatever that is, southern Utah, north, the north rim of the uh, Grand Canyon where you have Mormon uh, societies that are polygamous and you, you uh, actually, National Geographic just had an interesting article on them, I don't know, three or four years ago. And people will again talk about that as a, as a polygamous society. But then you ask yourself the question, what happens to the young men? And the answer is a social disaster happens to them. If they marry young, they also often have their wives taken away from them and given to one of the elder members of that society. And they ultimately become driven out of that society. Why? Because of 50-50. <laughs> you can't just say, hey, let's be polygamous. You want to be polygamous? I'm up for it. You up for it? Hey, it's all good with me. The only problem is it isn't good with God, so to speak, not God in the sense of, ooh, I'll send judgment. I mean, God in the sense of human design. We don't reproduce in a way that will fund polygamy. It's not an arbitrary choice. Need for long-term nurture of the young. As we already mentioned, yeah, it is a long time coming before you guys are ready for action on your own. And what do you need to do that? Do you just need food? No. In fact, the interesting thing about human beings is how complex our social nurturing is. And again, you want the statistics? You'll find out not only that human beings need role models. If for human beings to flourish, you need male and female role models. And actually what they found is the best situation for children to grow up in in almost any measure you want to have is not simply to have both a male and a female parent in the home, but actually your male and female biological parents in the home. 
interesting sociological finding. Back to the point in which you need long-term nurture, and the interesting environment is actually the parents who bore you. Huh. Next, we need to transform our environment in order to live in it, and that means we're going to have to live together. If we're going to live together, what's going to happen if we're going to have all these marriages uh, and all these trying to keep these family units together? You need something to mark off the territory, right? This person is mine the same way. Whereas if you have a house in Arkansas and I have a house in Tennessee, there probably won't be much confusion over whose field it is between us because there's, you know, 500 miles between our two houses. But if we live side by side, we're always going to have a battle about is this my turf or is it not? And that creates a need for some kind of legal social markers for whose field is whose. And that's where you get marker stones, or you might have white lines, you might have a million things that people have come up with. But you realize the need when you live in proximity is to mark out what belongs to whom. Same thing with marriage. Whose husband belongs to whom? Whose wife belongs to whom? Whose child belongs to whom? How do you view this? Is a child the property of the community? Is a child, quote, the property of the parents? Is a child the property of the mother? These are all interesting social and legal questions. But if you're going to live together, they have to be answered well. And finally, we're gregarious nature, well suited to living in complex societies. This is code word for the idea that we aren't just going to live together in a little group of four, six, or eight where we all know each other by name. But interestingly enough, we'll be living together in far, far more complex and diverse societies because we seem to be able to sustain that remarkably well. Once you have all those things in place, let me see if I actually have this. So, well, so let me go back. Once you have all those things in place, what do you end up with? Well, interestingly enough, you basically end up with a marriage relationship that connects male and female in a monogamous relationship lifelong in order to provide this context for children to grow up life, we can feel free to put in quotation marks here because that may only be 25 to 30 instead of actually all the way through to the end. But the point is by then, it's as good as lifelong for, for the central part of your human life. Um, need to transform our environment. We're going to have to make it social and legal. It's going to have to be a public institution, not merely a private statement of affections. In that sense, marriage will be unlike friendship. Right? You don't have to register a friendship. In fact, it's weird to even think about registering a friendship, right? That just, I mean, what's the function? So why is a marriage somehow different? Why does it always end up legal? Because it produces the next generation. And this is so essential for us to be able to flourish and thrive as a society. Um, so you end up with a thing that is stunningly like the definition of marriage that I just gave you. A sexual, procreative, lifelong, monogamous, legal, and social institution. And that sounds almost verbatim like I took it out of the definition of marriage that you had from our biblical survey. Point of all this exercise is that there's really nothing all that arbitrary about our marriage practices. Marriage socially institutionalizes certain irreducible facts about human nature. It does not create them. It just takes them and figures out a way to express them in some kind of a human social institution. Cultures express these in various marriage rituals and forms, but the core of marriage is remarkably consistent. And I think I've already given you my illustration of how many how many sleeves do you have on an Aborigine's shirt, if an Aborigine happens to make a shirt? And you realize as arbitrary as clothing is, it's going to have to be two, because human beings just have two arms. And marriage is a lot like clothing in that sense. It can be a lot of varieties wrapped around it, but there's going to be some very, very centrally core shared features about it, and those will include things like the procreative nature of it, the lifelong nature of it, the institutional, legal, you know, somehow recognized mark of it. And a lot of times, the things that people try and point out for the exceptions to this really are those weird exceptions that prove the rule, because you have to go through so many convolutions to drum up your exception. Uh, and if you want a look at this in a little bit more depth, uh, David Blankenhorn's book, The Future of Marriage, 
is a very, very good summary of the history of marriage practices uh, across human cultures and across basically from the time of the earliest recorded history we have to the present. It's a really, really impressive uh, collection of work. And one of the things that is most striking is his, his identification of the, quote, exceptions to this rule, how few they are and how hard they are to find. And once you find them, how often you realize, oh, this is so idiosyncratic as to actually reinforce the rule or the general principle. As I just said about the polygamy marriage thing, or polygamy monogamy thing, you identify the exception you identify the polygamous society, and then you look at it more closely and suddenly realize, oh wow, that is so dysfunctional or so problematic, it actually reinforces a general rule. Or you discover it's so exceptional within that society that they shouldn't actually be calling it a polygamous society, you just call it a monogamous society with a polygamous elite. And that, as I say, there's no problem with that kind of, a, well, there may be all kinds of problems with that, but there's no reason that you can't have a small minority that practice some sort of exceptional practice because they're only a small minority. But in terms of the big bulk of human life and human nature, it's going to end up looking that way. And notice this whole argument is not, there's nothing in this discussion that appeals to biblical teaching or biblical truth or Christian doctrine or God said so. This is reason reflecting on nature. In this case, reason reflecting on human nature regarding the essential features related to marriage and family. By the time you're done, you end up with something that looks remarkably like traditional marriage. Questions or comments on, on this? Because this is, well, let me put it this way. I would guess if I gave this at the average American university, I probably wouldn't have been able to complete this without people either trying to pick up rocks to stone me or uh, you know, shouting out some other words of opposition. So questions, comments? Yeah? So how does this play into like the debate right now with whether gays should be allowed to be married and have their you know, relationships or whatever they want? Like, how does that kind of form into this and our Christian worldview on that? So let me, for, do you have a comment related to that? Oh, I yeah. was going to say when you were talking about um, how important temptation is, how like, I don't, I've never viewed gay marriage from that perspective and that they can't like, reproduce. So eventually, like, reproduction is going to I don't know. Yeah. So, I mean, here, the, let me first make a point that most of what I've been talking about has intentionally been attached to just, let's get heterosexual marriage right. Let's figure out what this thing is all about. And you've already noticed, I've got a terribly bad attitude towards uh, the prevailing American attitude towards heterosexual marriage because, of, I, as I said, I feel like I live in a world where think, people think marriage is all about making me personally and privately happy. And I go, that is just a failed vision of marriage. Um, I think it will lead to terrible things. If I had to guess, it would lead to wildly high divorce rates, ever decreasing fertility rates, and an ever lower satisfaction in the marriage relationship. It's a flourishing of humanity. Yeah. It, it just, that vision of heterosexual marriage is not compatible with long-term flourishing. What have we found? Well, we tried it for 30 years, and it really has not been compatible. It has not made people happier. It has not made the, the society flourish more. It's done a worse and worse job at, at uh, reproducing the next generation. And the interesting thing is those who do make the next generation are the ones who are following the traditional pattern of marriage. They're actually getting married. They're living together. They're sustaining a long-term relationship. They become more fertile. They are more likely to have children. And they, they bear the weight, so to speak, of producing the next generation. And the more divergent the vision of marriage is, the less productive it is of the next generation. So that is 100% attached to the discussion of, of heterosexual marriage. And so the first thing I would like to say is most of my critique and my concern for contemporary America is our failed version of heterosexual marriage, not necessarily the controversy we have about gay marriage and other things. Now, we will talk about homosexuality in the class since you guys you know, want to talk about that. And I will hopefully have some time to talk about gay marriage. And I do think that that is, you know, problematic based on what I've talked about. But the first critique I, I would want you to see when I look at all this is a critique of current marriage practices. And I think that's the thing that is most disturbing to me for our current society, frankly, because the gay population is such a small percentage of society anyhow 
that answering the big questions right is going to be extremely important. Um, now, in our contemporary setting, the importance of the gay marriage issue is, is way elevated, and I think it is very important because of that. But in terms of the overall picture of our society, I really worry most of all about getting heterosexual marriage right. Do you think that the government bears a burden to uh, enforce or to teach something that would benefit the society as a whole? Well, yeah. So let's talk about this. What, what is the function of government? What should be, because I, I hear people saying all the time, look, marriage is a private institution. Why doesn't the government just keep their nose out of it? And would all be that much happier? Didn't I read, did I read the uh, Cameron Diaz uh -huh. thing? So he had that argument in there that the, the best thing that could happen is the government just to keep their nose out of marriage. What business of that is the government anyhow? What do you think about that? Good advice? Brittany, you're giving me a face. Give me a word. What, what would you say? I don't, I don't know, because like, that's why I'm smiling. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, See, that, yeah, you got my attention. Now you have to talk. I know. <laughs> I, I honestly don't know, because I'm really on the fence about it, because I feel like, in some sense, I feel like the government shouldn't be involved. But then, in another sense, I feel like they should be involved. And I don't know enough about both sides to be able to take a side on it. Um, but I think it is one of those things that is really controversial because the reason why our country is the way that it is mostly is because it was founded on Protestant evangelical principles. And I think that like we have, we still have like a very Christian nation, in a sense, and so, I don't know, I think that to some degree the government should be involved in upholding those principles, but... Okay. I, I get confused when I'm thinking about this because, like, if you have enough of a society that's intelligent and, uh, and is able to make wise decisions that will benefit the whole, well then the government can keep its nose out of it, but what if you have a whole bunch of people who are just, like crazy, uneducated people who are doing things that are destroying society, then the government needs to come in and add some stability, otherwise you're going to have chaos. So it seems like, I don't, it's hard, like, when do you say the government needs to step in and say, okay, listen, everyone's eating all this fast food, everyone's dying, you're getting high cholesterol, you know, millions of people are dying, and okay, so now we're going to enforce you can't eat these kinds of foods anymore. Well, then that's okay for them to do that, or... If the people aren't smart enough to make their own decisions, you know. Yeah. So when you let the government say, "Okay, we need to right now like put some, make some new laws," you know, to protect society, and then when you say, "Okay, you can't stick your nose in society that far," because then basically we have no more freedom. Like, yeah. Do we have the freedom to do whatever we want, or not? Do we have the freedom to? You know? Yeah. Good, good question, and that in some ways reinforces Brittany's concern of you can kind of you can tell the story both ways, so to speak. There's a certain set of issues you don't want the government telling you every single thing you're supposed to do. Good grief, that doesn't sound like a good way to live. On the other hand, there's some things that are so bad you don't want them to be legal. So now what do you do? You know, prescription drugs are built entirely upon that notion that they're good when used properly, but it's really easy to use them wrong. So we're gonna make it illegal for anyone but a doctor to be able to prescribe them. And when a thing becomes a quote, over-the-counter medicine, it's because they've realized now we have this figured out enough that it's relatively hard to actually do something really destructive with you. So even though you think that taking you know, some weird drug, echinacea or whatever it is, is going to be the wonderful cure to your, to your hives. Um, science thinks you're nuts, but the point is, a little bit of echinacea won't kill you, so let him take it, and he's happy, we're happy, whatever. Um, so you have, those, you have that kind of a spread, and there's things you'd never want the government to do that with. Uh, you think of uh, uh, Coumadin. Anyone had Coumadin? Anybody here have any problems? It's a thing they use to, for people who have problems with blood clotting and things like that. If you ever have a stroke or if you have an artificial heart valve, you may be on Coumadin. You know what else Coumadin is? Rat poison. That is exactly what it is. 
It's all a question of quantity. So it goes from being life preserving to life taking really quickly. Do you want Coumadin sold on grocery store shelves? Well, believe it or not, we are. <laughs> it's just in the rat poison department. So we say, hmm, most people aren't gonna say, hey, let me try a couple of these. Rat poison looks good to me. You want some in your soup too? Oh, great. We're not gonna do that because it is you know, labeled in that area. And then we have a lot of other drugs that we, or uh, chemicals that are sold in a grocery store that can kill you as well. Bleach, there's a million things you can do that'll wreck you. Um, but the weird thing is some of those things that we sell as a poison, might be being sold out the pharmacy window as a medication too, because it's that fine-tuned whether it's good or bad. So the government, I think, is often invoked in exactly those kinds of situations where it'd be very easy for the good to become bad, and we better put some boundaries around that that issue. The question is, where does marriage fit with that? Any comments on that? I'm still worried about Brittany lost in space here. Social, social space. <laughs> Yeah, interesting question when people say, I don't want marriage, I don't want the government to have anything to do with marriage, okay? Do you want the government to have anything to do with divorce? Do you want divorce to just be a matter of preference? Any kids here whose parents have divorced? Yeah. Do you want any regulation that maybe would entail dad giving money to support you? Because I'll tell you what, guys are flake brains when it comes to this. They just, they just take off with their wallet and leave you behind. Do you want the government to keep their nose the heck out of marriage? Well, I hope you're happy with them keeping their nose the heck out of divorce. And if dad wants to support you, let him. If he doesn't, don't. Because hey, marriage is just not the kind of thing the government should be involved in. How's that sound? So, so if we're defining marriage as something that is going to help society to flourish, um, then that would be something that would, homosexuality then would be excluded from that because it's not helping society to flourish if it's all going to fall So out. let me, let's come back to the homosexuality issue. If I were to look at this issue and just, I mean, play a couple of my cards on this thing before we talk about the whole background. Yeah. My biggest worry about the, this issue is simply saying, is, does marriage mean something? Or does it mean anything? And if marriage means roughly anything, whatever my personal preference is, if it is a privatized, very local, very personal thing that attaches to personal preferences, it's very, very hard for me to conceive of any way to properly say marriage should be permissible for heterosexuals, but it should not be permissible for homosexuals. Because in effect, what you're saying is heterosexuals, regardless of any other dynamics that go on in their life, should be able to have what they want to make them happy in the sexual realm. Homosexuals should not. If it is all about personal preference satisfaction, then I have a hard time figuring out why it is that we should make some big boundary marker between heterosexual and homosexual marriage. Because all they are is some weird label that have been dropped on human relationships in some sort of a you know arbitrary fashion. And by arbitrary, I just mean attached to personal preference. If, on the other hand, marriage is something different than that, something far more like what I've described here, then I kind of hold up my hands and say, well, why would we call it that? It is disconnected from all these other social goods that have just been described. And even if I was a person who had no sense of a problematic nature about homosexuality, I would just say, but why do you call that marriage? Um, a lot of the definitions I hear about marriage that come up with this, uh, a deep and intimate personal relationship um, that is, involves a, a lifelong pledge or something like that. I look at that and I say, you know what, I hate to admit it, but hey, I've got a half a dozen guys that I have every intent of having a lifelong relationship with, that I would fly across the country in a heartbeat if they said they had a problem and needed my help, that I've already given thousands of dollars to and supported them and they've supported me and my family. I call them friends. 
but I don't understand why if that's your definition of marriage that we shouldn't call them my marriage partners but somehow I've never been very confused about them and my wife. <laughs> and part of it, part of it is because I don't have sex with them. <laughs> and marriage has always had to do with sex. I mean, don't tell anybody, but it's true. When we talk about the marriage bed, we're talking about them like doing something other than sleeping on it. <laughs> and we're thinking that babies are going to pop out, and that's kind of how it works. And if you don't have sex, then they say your, your marriage isn't consummated. And that actually constitutes ground not for divorce, but annulment, as if the marriage never took, so to speak, because there was never sex as part of it. And we've always known that sex isn't an equal sign to having kids because we can control whether or not we have sex, in theory. But in practice, we have no control over whether or not we have kids, right? I mean, we, you can have sex all the time and never get a kid because of 10 million other factors. So there's never been an equal sign you can have between having a child and having a marriage. But there is an equal sign you can draw between having sex and having marriage. So legally, historically, humanly, we have almost always associated the consummation of marriage with having sex. Some cultures in some settings will actually tease it out to actually having children. It is that child having is that central to marriage. But if you were to look, I think, at the broad flow of this thing, it is attached to um, sexuality. So I'm just, again, I'm not trying to say anything very interesting. I'm just making the observation that the word marriage has a huge long history attached to it that's always involved copulation with a prospect of procreation. And to drop in some other thing that's a lifelong happy relationship with someone you're really committed to and care a lot about is also a very old and ancient human institution. We just call it friendship. And the fact that there's a sexual overtone of this in homosexual relationships I go, okay, but do you really want to look at that sex and ask, is it indistinguishable from heterosexual sex? And that's where I'm back to my sexually dimorphic creatures that mate for life and all those other kinds of things. Where I'm just saying, well, you know, actually it isn't. Let me put it this way. You could look at the entire life cycle of human society and you could eliminate all homosexual sex from that life cycle and, and the cycle would spin just as well as it ever did. You eliminate all heterosexual sex from that human life cycle, and what happens? Well, it's not a cycle, right? It's a plane wreck. So uh, to call them equal, to, again, I, I, even trying to distance myself from the moral judgment, just to call them equal seems to be just wildly counterintuitive to me. Um, even if they are both fulfilling in terms of emotional side and all that, and that's great, but back to the issue of one being able to be lifted out of a human life cycle with no change, one lifted out and then the entire life cycle ends. That's a pretty dramatic difference between those two things. So if you're looking at this broader definition of marriage, which is what I'm arguing is really one that's thrust upon us, not even as much from biblical literature as just human nature. If that's the version of marriage you're looking at, then it's really, really hard for me to match that up with gay marriage and use the gay marriage, use the marriage word. And people say, well, then are you okay with, you know, domestic partnerships? Well, if you want a list of all the things I'm not okay with in terms of sexual conduct, you'll be, you'll be stunned at how long the list is. I'm not okay with cohabiting. I'm not okay with all kinds of things. I'm not even that big a fan of pornography. So, uh, you know, if, if that's the question you're asking, well, no, but welcome to my world. If my government were to come up with the idea of we want registered domestic policy partnerships, I would probably shrug my shoulders about that one because that is moving it into a different category from the marriage thing. But that is exactly the bone of contention. I make no one happy by offering the domestic partnership thing. That's no longer on the table in our current discourse. So that, that's as, all I am doing is being kind of Neanderthal because I won't admit that these two things are equal, and I just go, well, to me, they just plain don't look equal. Um, domestic partnerships are a category people have talked about um, that I think, I mean, it all depends on what you're proposing, but I remember I had two, they're not exactly my answer, my cousin's 
aunts, but uh, one was 90, one was 92. They lived together for about 18 years after both of them had been widowed. Um, <laughs> if there was ever a couple of domestic partners, it was them. Um, there was nothing sexual going on there. Trust me, if you were to have seen that 92-year-old woman at the wedding dance that I did for my cousin's kid, yeah. Certain things I would have been a happy man never to have seen in my life. So th that's not what was going on there. On the other hand, would there have been certain cultural goods that might have been furthered by granting them a status of domestic partnership, so, such as you know medical benefits that one might have had from, from uh, her pension that the other one didn't have from hers, or a million things like that? I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm open to that discussion. But I would just say that's kind of one whole cluster of, of uh, you know, social policy questions that I'm kind of like, I don't know, I, I'd have to see the policy and, and you know, contemplate the consequences of it. But marriage, I just think, is a misattachment of a word that actually has a meaning. And this has become this weird argument about definitions that I'm like, hmm. Now this doesn't quite get back to the Brittany question of, what do we do with marriage and should the government care about it? I've hinted a little bit when I raised the issue of divorce, but there's another whole batch of things that I would like to point out that marriage does that is kind of interesting and sort of provocative. And before we're done, it should come back to this question. And I'm pointing my finger at you, I apologize. But I want you to remember that we haven't quite finished answering this. And I want to make sure that before I'm done, I come back to this because I'm going to lay a foundation that will speak to this. Uh, here. And it, are you guys okay with going about another 15 minutes so I'll be done with this and then we'll take a break and then pick up the, the next part? <laughs> if you're about to die or something, the door's open. Do what you have to do. <laughs> I don't even want to know. Okay. Um, so here's, here's my argument in effect. Um, so marriage is not an arbitrary human institution, even if it is deeply cultural. It's not arbitrary because there's these certain core things. Again, the idea of clothing having a neck hole and two arm holes if it's going on the upper torso on your torso. It's going to have two leg holes if it's going on your whatever the bottom half of your body is. What's below a torso? Your legs. Okay. Like, <laughs> never mind. Okay. So anyhow, it's not arbitrary. That's what I want you to know. You guys are so unhelpful. Okay. So if my claim is true that this institution I'm proposing is somehow deeply compatible with human nature, you would expect it to contribute to human flourishing. It would somehow pay off, so to speak. So this is a question I'd like to just address, kind of, I'll do this sort of in a hurry because I think the main thing is to get the overall feel of it. Uh, and so let me, let me do this. Uh, one expects societies that practice a sort of marriage to thrive. So looking at some of the personal benefits of marriage, and as I say, just as a confirmation of the natural law. This isn't so much of an argument for this. I'm just saying, look, if this is true, you would expect certain things to happen. Let's check and see if those things happen. There might be other reasons why they happen, but it should be interesting to see this as potentially a confirmation. So some of the personal benefits of marriage. Number one, most people still want it. At least in America, this is statistic is from, from probably about the year 2000, 95% of people still marry. Call it a broken institution if you want, but I'm telling you, 95% of people don't buy iPods, right? 95% of people doing marriage, at some point you have to say, wow, can that many people be wrong? And of course, yes. But at some point you say, that demands an explanation to get that many people buying off on a voluntary and demanding institution that has so much bad press, and yet 95% of people still want it. Um, here's one. Most people make it work. You may be now officially snickering beneath your little batting eyelids, but let me make an argument here. Most people make it work. The duration of marriage, here's a good question. What percentage of first time marriages end in the death of one of the partners rather than divorce? Anybody know? Here's an interesting fact. We don't, this is a really hard thing to track because you never know if a marriage is gonna end in death till somebody gets ahead and dies. So my wife and I have been married for about 30 years. Will our marriage end in death? Well, it hasn't yet, right? And everything can still go to pot, so how do you know? So this is always the problem. You're always dealing with soft figures when you ask this question. Roughly speaking, 
60% of first-time marriages, perhaps as high as 66% of first-time marriages, will end in the death of one of their partners, not in divorce. That's how close that is to a two-to-one ratio. You're twice as likely to have a marriage, a first-time marriage, end in death as you are in divorce. Maybe only 50% higher likelihood, maybe a fully twice as high likelihood. But you say, then why in the world do people say 50% of all marriages end in divorce? Well, let me just ask the obvious question. Once somebody gets divorced, 33% of the people in my little, let's do the two-thirds, one-third version, 33% of the people are going to get divorced. What do those people do? Do they stay unmarried for the rest of their life? No, they get married. What's the likelihood of a second marriage failing? Yeah, that's where it gets ugly, doesn't it? If 40% of your first marriages fail, over 60% of your second marriages are going to fail. And what happens when the second marriage fails? Are they going to stay single? No, they're going to get remarried. How likely is it a third marriage? Surely the third time's a charm, right? 75% of third marriages are going to fail. So how do you end up with 50% of your people getting a divorce if 60 to 65 percent of your marriages actually succeed, well, by having all those that fail become repeat failures. And so you keep having an ever increasing level of divorce from the multiple marriages, and that inflates the overall divorce numbers. Now, as I said, I don't have the best of numbers on this because I'm not sure the best of numbers are really there because it's really, really hard to predict. Um, when you're always looking ahead to try and guess, uh, you know, will a marriage actually succeed or fail? But that is the thing that I think I want to offer is a huge corrective to our common intuition. And this is part of why I bristle at, at the negative marriage talk. Oh, I don't know how anyone can make a marriage work in a culture like ours or at a time like this or in these circumstances. Or I think only Christians can possibly make marriage work. I'm going, wow. Why are we blasting marriage? Why are we making marriage sound so incompatible with ordinary human nature? I don't see that. I don't believe that. I don't think it's that unthinkable that you can make a marriage work. It may not be easy. Well, lots of things in life aren't easy. Uh, but the idea that people can do it and should be exhorted or encouraged to do it, I don't want to give up on that. And I don't think it requires divine intervention um, in order to make a marriage work. In other words, it is always a supernatural direct intervention of the Holy Spirit. I think everything is a divine intervention because this is a gift from God. But in terms of the, the sustaining it, it, it doesn't have to be that problematic. This is not like raising someone from the dead. This is how we were designed to live as human beings. So that's another reason why it might work. Some specific health benefits, these are interesting bordering on entertaining. Um, physical health. Married people have less illness, accidents, and murder. Married people are less likely to die from all causes, including heart disease, stroke, cancer, car accidents, and, believe it or not, murder. They spend less time in hospitals. They have higher recovery rates, including recovery from cancer, and they prob probably because they enjoy the care and concern of a spouse. In other words, we're not thinking of something miraculous. It just is the fact that you have that person beside them, and that helps you get better from anything. There's even evidence that the social support boosts the immune system, and therefore married people are less likely to catch a cold. How about that? For both men and women, the longer they are married, the healthier they are likely to become. Here's my favorite statistic. You know what the mortality rate is for unmarried women compared to married women in every age group? So here's how that would work. If you're, you know, you think of women between 30 and 35 years of age, how likely is it of a thousand women between 30 and 35 that one of them is going to die in a, that how many of them will die in a given year? Well, let's say 10 or something like that. Because, you know, usually if you're 30, you're not going to die that year. So there's this, you know, that, that many. And if a mortality rate was 20, then you'd have twice as high a mortality rate um, out of that pool. So you're not saying a huge number of people are dying, but the percentage, that's what they mean by mortality rate. So back to my original question. What is the comparative mortality rate of unmarried women to married women? Answer to the question, basically 50% higher mortality rate for unmarried women than married women in every age group. 
50% higher in mortality rate. You know what it is for guys? Two hundred and fifty percent higher. Unmarried men than married men. Now I know God said it's not good for man to be alone, but that's just ridiculous. And here's here's how it happened. There's a couple of factors, and this this demands an explanation. So people look around. The number one they think that they find out is that guys are terrible risk takers. So if I were to take like this, in fact, this collection of guys, I'm wondering if this wouldn't actually happen. If I locked all you guys together in a room, fed you three or four pizzas, left a skateboard in there and said, come up with some bright idea before long and say, whoa, dude, let's do this. You take your matrix, I'll put the skateboard on top and drive around camp and see how long it is till I fall off the back. And then you see how far you can go. Who never goes the farthest wins, okay? Whoa, cool, dude, let's do it. And off you go, boom, there you go. Off goes your matrix, you're on the top. Wham, there you go, bam, 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 bam. Next thing you know, we're scraping up John, taking off to the hospital because yes, he's one more statistic because married guys are 250 times more percent more likely to die of every cause, basically, than their married counterparts. Any married guy in that group would say, I won't do that because if I did that, my wife would kill me. <laughs> it's very simple, so we don't do it. The other thing that happens is wives happen to care for their husbands and make them care for themselves. Not that this would ever happen, but it's possible that my wife has moved me off whole milk onto 2% milk. That was okay because it was still white. Then she went to the 1% milk and there's this weird shade of blue that kind of stayed on the top and I thought, whatever, she's mine. And then finally we go to my friend's house who for some crazy reason has this non-fat milk. It's like dishwater in a bottle. And next thing you know, my kids all drink it for three days while we're with them. And then when they come home, she said, well, the kids like to find I think we'll just go for non-fat milk. And I'm like, oh no. If she keeps this up, I can live to be 190. It's just ridiculous. So I eat whole grain bread and no fat milk and all this stuff. And I'm, I mean, I don't want to sound too pathetic, but the reality is I would not have changed one feature of my diet left to my own devices. <laughs> Sherry's the one who's always saying, Rick, you need to go to the dentist. You need to go to the doctor. And it becomes hard after a while to argue, no, I don't. I'm, you're what? You're Iron Man, what are you? You do need to go to the doctor. Shut up and go to the doctor. So after a while you do it, and lo and behold, you live longer. So, welcome to marriage. Anyhow, I'm not, we're pathetic guys, we just are. So. All right, emotional health, uh, less mental illness, less stress. Isn't this an interesting thing? You know that doctor with the Cameron Diaz thing? that was talking about how the number one source of stress, what everyone comes to talk to me about, is their marriage problems. Did you ever think that if you're gonna spend somebody, uh, spend $150 an hour with someone, you'd talk about what was most important to you? So the fact that you come in and talk about a marriage, is that really that shocking? That you're gonna talk about the things that really matter? What are we supposed to talk about, how my lawn's doing? I got this spot of crabgrass, it's just a kidder. You got any ideas on that? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not gonna spend 150 bucks an hour, number one and number two, no matter how bad my crabgrass is, I'm not gonna get an ulcer over it. If my marriage has got a problem, I might. Why? Because I care so much about my marriage. But that said, overall married people have less stress than unmarried people. Or singles, any category, so singles, widowed, divorced, you name it. Uh, less loneliness, better psychological well-being in almost every category that they, that they measure. Um, sexual benefits of marriage. Faithful married couples are the most satisfied with their sex lives of any group. This is according to the National Mar Sex Survey. Married couples have sex more often, they enjoy it more both physically and emotionally than singles do. Um, there's one of the great lies in our culture. That singles have more fun, singles have more sex, and singles enjoy it more. Wrong, wrong, and wrong. That is simply not true. I think we already, did I do the opinion poll here about when the last time you saw married sex portrayed in a movie was? Did we talk about that in this class? I want you to think about that. When was the last time you saw something really creepy and gross like married people having sex portrayed in a movie? Or is that so gross that we wouldn't want to show it in public? Can you think of a movie where you've seen married couple having sex? 
can you think of a movie where non-married couples have had sex? Can you think of a movie where they haven't had sex? Is there something wrong with this picture? Hey, we don't make culture, we just reflect it. No, you don't. No, you don't. No, you don't. You're making things up. Because married people have more sex, they enjoy it more, it's better physically, it's better emotionally, it's just plain better. Just plain better. But we like to tell lies about those kinds of things. Benefits to the children of those growing up. Better academic performance, less criminal behavior, less premarital sex, less vulnerability to peer pressure. That is a huge thing for all kinds of public health issues. Stronger parent-child emotional bonds, better emotional health, better physical health, less abuse, less poverty. Now, here's what I want you to think of. You are a sociology graduate student. You are writing your dissertation. You have done like 10, 10 million years of research on social programs. You have dug high and f wide and far and deep and you, found, and you finally bump into this incredible social program that increases academic performance of children. It decreases the amount of criminal behavior they have. It decreases the amount of perimetal sex they have, it decreases their vulnerability to peer pressure and with it drug abuse. Improves the bond with their parents. It creates them more healthy emotionally, less depression. Improves their physical health. Decreases the amount of abuse that they experience in the home and decreases their poverty. And I ask you one question. Should you implement that program? Can you think of any reason why you'd want to? Can you think of any reason why you wouldn't? And how would you feel about your government if they had found that kind of a program and decided, we don't care, that's not important, who cares? That's not what the government is for. What the heck is the government for? Is our government not supposed to care about criminal behavior? Or do we want to treat crimes after they happen? Oh, that's a preventive thing, we don't do prevention. Wow. If the government isn't supposed to care about the things on that list, tell me, please, what do they have that they're supposed to care about? Now, if marriage is simply an issue of getting two people's happy point eternalized in writing, I'm happy to acknowledge the fact that that should be broadly irrelevant to my government. But if you find out the government, that marriage is actually far deeper than that, far more significant than that, and has huge social consequences, then perhaps you might want to say, oh, we should actually encourage that. We should reward it. We should incentivize it. Here's a classic example of this. I own a house. The government gives me a tax break for owning the house. People will often, who rent, will often resent that fact and say, what's the government, who do they care if I rent or if I buy? Why does the government care if I rent or I buy? Anybody know? Interesting, I, I did this uh, thing called building a generation where they went through 40 risk factors for kids for all these kind of behaviors you just listed here and they asked, so what are the things in your community that will foster that and how can you make it better? When a number, they had five things in the Redlands area community that were problems they needed to work on. Number one or number two was what they called, quote, community mobility. How long are people in a community? Because that contributes enormously to how much they care about supporting the community. Um, and because of a very unstable population base, you have a lot more problems with your kids. So anything you can do to make people more stable in that area benefits the society. So we're sitting here in a social policy forming thing trying to come up with ways to make people stick. Same time I'm buying a house. We finally get this house deal done. I get the gas guy to come out to turn on the gas. I'm you know there with him. We walk into the backyard. He looks down at the gas meter and looks up to me and he asks me one question. He goes renting or buying? And I go, I'm buying. He goes, huh. And he breaks out his spray paint and he sprays the, the gas meter gray again. And I looked at it and you know why he sprayed it gray? 
because with one of those black grease pens, he puts the initials and the date of every new person who rents that thing. And you know what? That thing looked like a pile of graffiti. There were so many names and initials been on. But if I was renting, he wasn't going to bother spraying it over because I'm going to be come and gone in eight years, eight, eight months. Reality was I bought that house and lived there for 12 years, and then I moved to another house in that community and lived there for 18. So you incentivize buying a house as opposed to renting it because it makes your community more stable, and a more stable community has all these benefits for the government, so the government can afford to spend money preventing things that otherwise they're going to spend a lot more money curing after they happen. So back to my point, is there any reason at all why government should, merit, should incentivize, and I should point out these are the benefits that attach to traditional marriage, especially as associated with family rearing and childbearing. I go, well, yeah, as a matter of fact, there is. It's not because of uh, a Puritan Christian tradition in the background of America. I mean, we may have that, but that's not what I'm arguing. I'm arguing from a tangible, immediate benefit on the exact kind of things that contribute to the common good that should be the central concern of our government. If you can find some other institution that does half as many good things, I will encourage you to promote that too. But the idea that the government shouldn't care, shouldn't incentivize, and it doesn't matter how we treat marriage, I think is a little slice of social delirium. It does matter. It does make a difference. It has huge social consequences. And to act like it doesn't because of some you know, contemporary mode of what counts as being politically correct or incorrect, you know, we can do it if we want. But I think we'll find human nature remarkably unforgiving on that point. If we don't produce the next generation, we have a real problem. How much is your house going to be worth? If you have 33% less population in your town 40 years from now when you want to sell your house and retire. Oh yeah, this hits you in the wallet, doesn't it? Because you've reduced the demand for uh, housing by 33%. What's that going to do with your price? Gabe, my little uh, business uh, mind should be working back there. That's going to be really bad, won't it? How are we going to fund Social Security if 33% fewer people are working? There's a huge incentive to actually produce the next generation. Soviet Union practically collapsed because of the failure of people to reproduce. Um, largely because of the destruction of marriage and also partly is this dismantling of the attachment between parent and child. They wanted the children to be attached to the state as opposed to the individual parents. That was an important part of creating the communist man. Well, you start doing that and suddenly people don't care about producing the next generation and suddenly you don't have the next generation. So this is a huge, huge issue. Uh, modern Western Europe. It's very common for us in discussions like this to point to Western Europe and say, hey, you know what? Why can't we do really good daycare programs the way they do in Denmark or in Germany or some of these other places? Well, number one, we can. Number two, why in the world do they have to do it? Because they're trying like crazy to incentivize people having children. And they want to make it as easy and painless as possible. So you can drop your kids off in a really good daycare and keep doing your job. Just go ahead and make the kids, because we're short on kids. And we're going to incentivize you producing the next generation. So contemplate the future when you contemplate marriage. Contemplate the meaning of marriage within a society when you make your social policies. And, and follow the practice of making social policy that rewards good and beneficial behaviors for the building of your society. And you'll find very quickly that one of the behaviors at the top of the list is very old-fashioned, traditional, boring marriage with kids. Go ahead and break out the wood panel station wagon. I don't mind. Um, the bottom line is that it's just absolutely foundational to the health and well-being of a society. That's been our intuition for millennia. It's now our academic information if we care about that more in the 21st century. But it's always been a feature of, of human nature. So we want to talk a little bit about a theology of work. And I, I realize we actually have a group that's presenting on this, right? We have who is, who's, uh, Gabe, is that your group? 
Beverly, and okay, so you guys have, uh, I don't want to steal too much of your thunder here with this thing, um, but on the other hand, I imagine there's plenty to be said about this, so you guys probably have a lot of other stuff and it won't matter too much, but we may do this a little bit less than I might do it otherwise. Let me begin by just uh, talking a little bit about well, actually, I think I have this quote. Let me see here. Yeah. Uh, giving you a quote on work from a guy named Studs Terkel. Uh, if that isn't a winner of a name, I don't know what is. Uh, but Studs Terkel, he actually did a batch of books. He's a radio show host. He did uh, several kind of books that kind of spun out of those things. Uh, and really interesting guy. And the book Working has become an absolute classic in this field. He interviewed, gosh, how many people was it? 200 people? Maybe it's an 800-page book. Basically 100% composed of interviews he had with people doing interesting jobs. A lot of things you'd never think of. One of, the, one of my favorites is the guy, what's his name? Hops, I think is what he calls himself, who is a piano bar guy. So he plays piano at a piano bar. And he interviewed this guy about his job. Uh, you'll hear some quotes a little bit later from an uh, interview with a guy named Mike, Mike Lefevre. And Mike is a guy who works in a steel mill. And to hear him talk about his work, he is a guy who should have been a philosopher. I mean, he is incredibly articulate for a guy who is a high school dropout working in a steel mill. Um, it's, it's kind of amazing, uh, the, the kind of thought that's reflected in that. So anyhow, it's a fascinating book. But this is from the introductory paragraph in that book. And here's what he writes. This work, this book, I'm sorry, being about work, is by its very nature about violence to the spirit as well as the body. It is about ulcers as well as accidents, about shouting matches as well as fist fights about nervous breakdowns as well as kicking the dog around. It is above all, or beneath all, about daily humiliations. To survive the day is triumph enough for the walking wounded among the great many of us. Now, I just want you to think a little bit about this. Talk to me about this. How do you feel about that as a description of human work? Let me just. So, so I, I'm hearing, at the very least, a certain motivation for a corrective. Let me just make, if you wanted to fill this out more, what might you say to make this a better description for what you would like it to actually, read? you know, again, we're thinking integrative theology now. We've laid a lot of foundation for the idea of doing this kind of thinking. You are now giving kind of the final statement, your best knowledge of the word, your best knowledge of the world. Uh, you bring those together. You think about work. What, when you look at that statement, how would you want to correct it to get it right, so to speak? Chris. I like what Cameron was saying, um, ulcers as well as triumphs, shouting matches as well as um, encouraging each other, nervous breakdowns as well as, um, yeah, there you go, adding the good. So add the good to the bad but don't necessarily remove the bad. No, because some of it sucks. Yeah. OK. There you go. I think I'll leave that off the board. But yeah, I get the idea. <laughs> what else? Anything else you want to add? Give the perspective for like the whole of society rather than just the individual um, outcomes. OK, good point. Um, it's not just about you. Yeah, that should be a theme for us by now, practically, isn't it? You think of marriage not being just about us? Well, likewise with work. Um, oopsie, broader society. What else? Does working make you more human or less human? Does, OK. So should work humanize or dehumanize? Depends on your field of work. OK. Well, so these are questions. I 
That's one of those things that comes up a lot. There's some fairly famous lines actually attached to that. You guys ever read Karl Marx? Do you ever bump into that anywhere? Think, how many have? How many have had some kind of exposure to Marx's thoughts somewhere in the course of your education? What was his critique? Let's we'll ring a few ancient bells here for us, if you, uh, whenever that was that you read this. What did he think about work? Was it important or unimportant? The Iron Page? Page. Is that him? Do you know? I don't know. Good question. Uh, you said something about you know how it defines our identity. There's something else you said after that that I wanted to write down, and now that I got after the... It might be like the main aspect of our humanity? Yeah, well, that's what I mean here. So it kind of defines our identity, our humanity, I should put here. But then you said something after that. Oh, yeah, okay, so remember the concept of alienated labor? Yeah. So, um, alienating from yourself and from others, and from well, and interestingly enough, it's alienating you from the product of your own work. That's one of the perversions of these kinds of labor where, where the work of your hand should be a blessing to you instead it rises up to mock you in this industrialized capitalist scenario. Um, yeah, and for Marx, so with, with Karl Marx, you have an alternative, complete alternative vision of the history of the universe. He, 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 he is St. Augustine done materialistic. So Augustine writes The City of God is a complete history of, you know, how explaining <laughs> all of human history is this battle between the two loves. For Marx, a uh, very similar thing, dialectical materialism, and basically the history of humanity is a story of basically our relationship with the means of our production. Uh, and it's a very materialistic, very work-oriented uh, kind of a theology of history, if, apart from that, and maybe you have to call it an atheology of history. But clearly, work is a hugely important thing. How important is work in the Christian world? Is that just all wrong? Is work actually important? Where does it fit on the scale? created to do. Okay, so it is potentially fairly important. It's essential to our, uh, who we are. And how did that change with the fall? Or did it? I feel like the fall just made it so that we would see in the pain and the suffering to look to God. So God like put the fathers to remind us Okay, but bottom line is it doesn't change the fact that we're still created to work. It just it's not going to be as much fun as it would have been in the garden. Okay, yeah. Work is done in proportion to what you've been called to be faithful to. So um, we're called to rest after we've completed what the Lord has called us to complete. You know, like I think it's just an offering to to ask the fact that it's pushing farther than we were called to. So work is good within boundaries, so to speak, yeah. or should be kept within boundaries? Yeah, okay. Brittany. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Have we got? Because here's, here's my thing. You guys are going to spend 40 hours a week times 50 weeks a year, so that's 2,000 hours, roughly speaking, times 30 years. So what is this now? 2,000 times 30 is 60,000 hours working. Mm -hmm. 
maybe 80,000. That is an impressive pile of hours. And here's my thought. If I could do anything, anything, to make your work good instead of bad, I mean, like, you guys would owe me so bad. I mean, it'd be pathetic. Uh, 80,000 hours of your life, how can you make work be good work instead of bad work? How can you make it a blessing instead of a curse? How can you make work part of paradise rather than part of hell? I think this is a pretty darned important question. And you really want to work to get the answer to it right. And I would argue just like marriage is a human institution, not simply a Christian institution, I would argue the same thing about work, right? Partly because it's very, very parallel. In my original argument with marriage, I point out the fact that, hey, marriage is not only pre-Christianity, it's pre-fall. It's pre-Judaism. It's pre-Moses. It's pre-Noah. Good grief. It's pre-Abel and Cain. Uh, it's got a long pedigree. And if I can say that about marriage, you know what? I can say the same thing about work. It is deeply part of fundamentally human nature. It's not a thing you get to opt in of or opt out of or some other thing that is very, very <laughs> deeply attached. And therefore, the same way you want to get marriage right, you want to get work right. And in many ways, I would argue there's almost as much theological significance attached to work as there is to marriage. And we're going to think a little bit about that. But before we jump into that quickly, I want to play just a couple of clips of people talking about their jobs and thinking about what they are saying about what makes work good, what makes work bad, and how you should figure out what work you should do. Because I think for most of the people in this room, that question is a real biggie. How do I figure out what to do? I love this phrase. Follow your bliss path. I just feel happier hearing it. Um, it's about yourself. Now, when you're saying that, Krista, what do you mean? Um, James brought up that it's not just about yourself, it's about the community. And how okay. marriage affects the community, how work affects the community. And he did not help a lot of that. He talked about his people that work with him a little bit. But other than paying rent, there wasn't too much outside of, like, if you want to put a positive term on it, his passions instead of just his happiness. Is there some way I can make this light go off? <laughs> Why am I feeling so badly? There we go. OK. So yourself more than broader society, any of those kinds of things. OK, yeah. He talked a lot about not giving in to like the um, view of success, I guess, of like the world and like in that making money. And at the end, he said the moment that he became successful was when he started doing this. Down his. But like, I'm just wondering if he would still feel that way if stuff had turned out differently. Ooh. How many failed blue men are there, like the Green Man group, that you've never heard of, right? Because the Green Man really stunk. <laughs> uh, good question. And it's the only reason this sounds like such a cute story is because he won, so to speak. Um, yeah. What I do find interesting, though, um, but I don't know if I agree with the term like bliss path. I think it is cool that um, if the opportunity to like, because I was always growing up, I was always, like, babysitting and doing all those things. People were like, you need to be a teacher, you need to do those things. Definitely, like, had the skills to do that. That's not where my heart is. That's not what makes me happy. I can do it, but mine is in communication and relationships and those things. And so I, I think it's interesting to be like, yeah, like, he's good at economics and finances and those things. And he could have well gone into a different career, but he chose to do something that truly made him happy. And when he went to work, he was excited to do so. So I think that I think that's I that's what I took out of like a positive kind of thing. Of okay. Like, yeah. And, uh, and uh, so in this case, 
Uh, I don't want to call it calling because that creates other connotations. So let me just put it in a kind of milk toast way. The job suited him in a deep sense of that word, as opposed to this kind of milk toast. Like you know, just <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> Namby <laughs> Pia, right? I'm not going to go off on a milk toast explanation. I'll self control. <laughs> so the job was deeply suited to who he was somehow. It kind of captured that part of him. Yeah, Chris. Maybe to answer kind of that question, like, there's, I don't know if there's necessarily just one job that will suit people. Maybe there's, even for him, more jobs that were suited him. So if yeah. you get this, if he still followed you know, his bliss path or whatever, you know, like, followed his passions, it, it still could have been. He could have been saying the same thing. So this is an interesting question here. You know, do we go, is the lesson here that we go questing for the holy job, holy job grail or holy grail job or whatever it is you want to call it, the, that one job that's just, ooh, that's you. We were talking about that for whether there's one, marry, one person here to marry, right? Notice the parallelism here where you kind of do have this think of, yeah, that one job that's just, built for me. Yeah, Stephanie. I was been thinking also about those who can't really um, afford to look for different types of jobs. They have to take what's given to them and available to them. So like families are very like, by by three jobs and like what does that look like in relation to work? And Yeah. <laughs> Try living in a country with forty five percent unemployment and talk to somebody about their bliss path. My bliss path? A paying job, stupid. What do you think? I mean, I don't care what I do. Just pay me and I'll do it. Because um, I want to eat. And I'd really like my kids could eat too. Yeah. I guess, I think I would like to more, or know more about how it does affect his relationships and the community around him. Because I guess I wouldn't be quick to say it's all about him. I mean, how he talks about it. Yeah, and I think that I think there's a good. That's a good caution as you hear him talking about that. He did indeed say those words that could be read that way, and I don't think there's any denying that. But it isn't entirely clear that he is playing merely to himself. Um, he's trying to be true to something that was in him, and this is a little bit of the thing we're talking about with, with Stephanie with a job fit thing. Um, though there's this other part of it, you do wonder how much of this is just doing what you want. I mean, I, I think the bottom line is we don't know from what we heard where he's really coming out on that. And I think we have an anxiety about this. I think there's really two versions of it. That's why I ask you, what do you mean by serving yourself? Because as you said, he's thinking about making me happy. There's another thing about what you might call self-generated calling. And more than anything, I want to have a sense of calling. I'm doing the thing that I was, quote, made to do. And the way our culture tends to answer that question is look within. If you have any doubts about that, just tune in the last 12 Disney cartoons and you'll have it. Be yourself. Have you guys seen Aladdin? Yeah, oh yeah. And that whole idea that I will find the, the answer to the quest after the perfect me job by fundamentally looking within. That is pretty deeply rooted within us. Um, whether or not it's entirely right or wrong, we can have a discussion about because I have some concerns about it. But that we believe that, I think, is pretty descriptive of America. Yeah, Cambry. Yeah, going up what you said, it just seems very ambiguous because there's no, the only measurement is himself. But I thought it was interesting how he was talking about not really taking into consideration what all his teachers and everyone else had said, and also the fact that those awards that they had won didn't mean anything to him. And when he said that, it struck me not that he was being sincere, but that just was odd when he said that. You even external factors like that don't mean anything. Like it's all just inside him of yeah. whether he, and not that he's being selfish, but it's just all, all the measurements of 
his bliss paths are bliss paths are from within and like external factors, whether they be negative, like his teacher of positive, like an award, have no effect on him at all. Yeah. Yeah, interesting point. Of, and I, I don't know that he's so much being disingenuous. I'm not sure he's been fully self-reflective about how much success in, and, you know, if you're an entertainer, is it a good thing not to care if anyone was entertained? I mean, can imagine being a chef. I don't care if anybody likes my food. Okay, I'll go to a different chef, right? I mean, my gosh, if that's my chef's attitude, I'm sorry, I'm going to a different restaurant. I felt like what he was saying though, was like, let's say you're a chef, but you hate your job, and everyone loves your food, and you're getting all these awards. Those awards don't mean anything to you because you're not really okay. what you're doing. So I felt like his emphasis was like, all you have is the moment. Let's say you're gonna have 80,000 hours or whatnot. All you have are those moments. So it's like do something you're passionate about, something that you love to do, because all you have are these moments. So like create the moment that you're gonna to wanna to be living for the rest of your life. And don't do something you're gonna hate because then it doesn't matter how much money you make or how many awards you get, yeah. it's all meaningless. External praise won't solve internal pain. There's no amount of gold records that'll make up for the fact that I wish I was a, a, running a, a Chinese laundry instead of being in the Blue Man Group. I've always wanted to do dry cleaning, what can I say? Um, and I think that's a good point. I mean, I think that really is a big part of what he was, that was a more, I think that's a more accurate statement of what he was really saying there when he was talking about who cares about the gold, gold record. I think yeah. really that was the point. Good point by saying you should enjoy the day today and not just strive for the awards. Because the awards, like, they do fade. Even if you love them, they fade. And so you have to love the day today. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think that was a good point that he made. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And the phrase that I heard him say was achievements are overrated. So that, to me that says, what is society saying about, you know, you need to achieve all these things and then, you know, you've made it or something like that. But he was saying it's, we put too much of an emphasis on this end thing. You know, I'm going to get this because I did all this work or whatever. Yeah. And I think he was just saying, well, that's, that's an over-exaggerated emphasis on that. Yeah. Good, good point. And that is, and that's also a little different saying that achievement is worthless. Um, have you guys ever seen the Blue Man Group? Mm -hmm. they're, they're they're <laughs> yeah, I guess they're going to be down in the Surgistrum in, uh, in Orange County or somewhere. And I saw that they were plugging them at Biola. I, I mean, the things those guys do are just uh, unbelievable. And, and I do want to, whenever you play one of these tapes, there's a part of me wants to just give an official disclaimer which says, I don't care what that guy says, he's a genius. And I might even put in italics down below, you're probably not. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to put too fine a point on it, and I know we love to tell everybody that you can grow up to be president, but actually you probably can't. <laughs> I mean, it's just an observation, but most people don't actually, and most of the people who don't actually probably couldn't. It just wasn't, gonna, it's not gonna be in the cards. I'm sorry, honey. <laughs> but it's true, and, and I worry that then you end up with this weird thing that in the absence of questing after the Holy Grail and finding it, your life degenerates into a worthless, meaningful pile of 80,000 hours of work with no point. And if the only self-validating work is being something like the Blue Man Group where people like me look at them and say, I cannot believe they can do that. That thing with the marshmallows? You ever seen them do the marshmallow thing? What? I've got a whole bag of marshmallows. 30 feet away, this guy starts throwing marshmallows, the other guy catches them in his mouth. So that's the way it starts. They're about eight or 10 marshmallows in and he's packing these, you got play chubby bunnies. So this is Blue Man Group version of chubby bunnies. So the guy packs in eight or 10 marshmallows, and then the guy starts throwing them like that. And by the time he's done, he's throwing these 140 mile an hour fastballs, and the guy whoop, 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 catches everything a marshmallow. Gets the whole bag of marshmallows in his mouth. The last half of it at 100 miles an hour. And I just look at that and say, okay, fine. Am I, am I supposed to go do that? <laughs> the gig's up. There's another one of these things like this. We got this from Road Trip Nation. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen that deal. Uh, there's another one that I have on my, on my computer there of this uh, woman who's a piano player. And you know, oh, you know, you've got to, her dad wanted her to be a doctor, but she'd like to do music. And so she ended up being a, a concert pianist. 
you know, it's great to have that little picture at the beginning, but then you need to watch her play. And they have this like 15 second clip of her playing the piano. At that point, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm done, I'm out. That's just so not happening with these fingers. I mean, <laughs> it was never gonna happen, by the way, even if mom and dad did whip me into shape to sit at the piano. My coordination on these little fingers, you should see me try and dance. I mean, <laughs> good night. Uh, my son's getting married and I'm praying that I break a leg before I have to stand up and do a dance. It just, <laughs> not him, me. I, I don't take it out on him. He's like dance crazy, you know. He's swimming on the other end of the gene pool. But there's some of these things, I'm just, I am never gonna do that. Never gonna happen. Is there something good for me in work? What if I'm just average? Did you ever think that 50% of the people are probably average? <laughs> so what do you do? Well, you're probably gonna end up with an average paying job. If you're wondering why, because you're average. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I tell you, I mean, I would be, I mean, obviously I don't teach in the school of education because you know, I'd be unemployed. I'd be, we can't, every kid has got to be like the zenith of accomplishment and everything's wonderful and perfect. And I'm like, well, no, not actually. <laughs> I've checked, 50% of the kids are below average, it's true. I was a math major, I figured these things out. <laughs> um, so does that make them worthless? Does that even make them worth less? I don't think so. And I think there's something really wrong with our thinking about jobs if that's how we have to get a vision of success and worth is by doing something like wildly exceptional that you honestly realize probably not gonna happen. This girl who was the you know, concert pianist, at age 25 she decided to take up Taekwondo. So by the time she was age 30 she was a, f well 35 whatever it was, she was a five time national US Taekwondo champion. So at that point, I'm like, back to my original thing. Uh, you know what? I'm, I'm proud of you, honey. Uh, that's really cool. But as a normal life expectancy, <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't think most of us are destined to be a concert pianist and a five-time US champion taekwondo expert. I'm just thinking, probably won't happen. So we've got to get an alternative vision of what the positive meaning of work is like. If that's how work becomes good, I'm worried that for 99% of the population, work will just be bad. And I don't think that's a biblical vision of work. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.